Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. Engage So today we have Adam from Sweden, and we will be talking all about Adam in a few seconds. But before we do, I want to know, Adam, are you prepared to engage? Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's do this. So Adam is, he, he is Adam Palm, Palmquist. Is, am, I, am I getting that pronunciation decent? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Adam has worked as a game designer and a game consultant for educational and serious game games all around Scandinavia. He, he wrote the first and as of today, the only book in Swedish about gamification. Adam is right now a PhD candidate in informatics at the University of Skovde. He also works as a gamification designer and evangelist at the Swedish gamification studio Insert Coin. Is there anything else that we missed from that intro, Adam, that you would like to mention? No, that was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks to you for being and spending this time today as a PhD candidate and as a, a gamification consultant. I'm sure your agenda is pretty packed. So we really appreciate your time for spending it today with the engagers. So Adam, we would like to know, to get started, to get a bit more familiar with what you do and what's your, what is your regular work. What does a regular day with, with Adam look like, with a, with a PhD candidate and a consultant in gamification? What does it look like? Ooh, that depends, actually, because I'm doing my PhD, CEO, my PhD candidate as, uh, and, and it's called an uh, industrial fellowship. So it's uh, the industry is paying, the gamification industry, the gamification instant coin is paying my, um, my PhD uh, it's quite uncommon here in Sweden to have this arrangement. Uh, so um, I'm doing this on like 60 or 75 percent, something around that. So if it's uh, some days I'm at the university doing my research about gamification and completion and in a higher education uh, regarding what is uh, called in Europe and also in the U.S., uh, the great student retention crisis because we got a quite a fair few of the students uh, are dropping out, dropping out um, college, or dropping out higher education, and it's starting to starting to amass as a really big problem, especially here in the Scandinavian countries where higher education is more or less uh, free. And uh, but the university only get half of the of the amount for taking in students when when a student begin a course, but they only get they got the uh, they got the other half when they complete the course. So there's a lot of money that is fro a lot of research money that is frozen in the in the system. So you you cannot touch them because students in Sweden, for example, has has right to return up to five years after not finish a course. So there's there's a lot of money and it's it's building, it's growing more more. It, the amount of money is growing more and more every every year actually. So that's my reason. But I I think we can solve some of these problems with gamification, better onboarding to um, higher education courses, better onboarding in um, higher education programs. Yes, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced of that. And not only in higher education, I would argue that higher K, K through 12, I mean, I think every single level of education has, of course, it's manifesting in different ways. But I do think that there is an engagement crisis in general in, in education where, of course, and, and I, I always like to mention this as well, because there's there's two levels of to that to that crisis. And, and one of the levels is those people who don't have, even have access to education. And that's certainly a problem. But where access is not a problem, I, 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 I'm, I can attest to, <laughs> to completely to, to say that there is an, an important 
crisis in the engagement and it's it's where a lot of the effort is actually being lost because those people as you're mentioning that they start and don't finish not only are those research budgets getting frozen but those th- those people who start it um, maybe they have a very valid reason for for dropping out but if it's because their classes were not engaging and that they were not uh, feeling comfortable with that um, it's pro- it's not probably because they didn't want to study but because the things were not happening as they as they, as, they, as they needed so I am sure that there is a lot of room for improvement there and a lot of great things that could happen and I hope you you're very successful in in all these research and the application of whatever it is that you find Adam I wish you all the best absolutely oh thank you and uh, that's that's one one regular day <laughs> in my <laughs> life uh, not a, as I work as a evangelist for insert coin I'm doing a lot of lectures I do lectures, a lot of work, gamification workshops, a lot of gamification demos uh, in schools, in uh, higher education, of course. But uh, I got roots. Uh, I'm, I'm a teacher myself, so I'm doing a lot of lectures in public schools here in Sweden, Norway, Denmark. Uh, I did a, uh, I was on a tour, lecture tour in Finland a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so doing a lot of, a lot of, a lot of lectures as well. But I also uh, go to different fairs. I'm going to. I'm planning a trip down to the Hanover Fair. Um, uh, as uh, from a year, a year past, I'm starting. I started to get more and more involved in in industry, production industry here in in Scandinavia, and it's something uh, in industry all over the world. They're talking about Industry 4.0, and it's basically about Digital uh, digitalization in industry. So I'm doing a lot of uh, workshops, a lot of gamification workshops with big and uh, production industry industry companies, talking about gamification, implementing gamification platforms, and so on and so forth. And that's really fun because industry, at least here in Sweden and uh, in Germany and in Scandinavia, industry really takes science seriously. I've been in a lot of places talking about gamification and I'm meeting people in some places that it, does this really work? But in in industry, production industry, they see if I present some of my articles and some of the research done in gamification in recent years, they say, okay, we see you got uh, empirical data on this one, you got uh, um, evidence. So uh, let's go there. They're very, very into research production industry here in Scandinavia, at least. Yeah, they're 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 keen on 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 taking that research and actually applying it into the industry, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so uh, I'm I'm multitasking at the moment. A lot of <laughs> a lot of my own research, a lot of uh, a lot of, but but basically, uh, the the one thing that's keeping my uh, my field together it's gamification but also teaching uh, learning actually learning because um, industry 4.0 it's not about getting more efficient work as or a more efficient work group it's it's about how you can educate and retrain your existing staff your engineers to uh, get more digital how to program how to uh, program uh, assembly line robots and so on and so forth so it, it i'm and i i worked as a teacher before i went into gamification before i went into to research and uh, so i'm i'm living i'm living the dream <laughs> best of two <laughs> absolutely, worlds absolutely absolutely yeah. adam so let's let's move into the into the next question that we always have for our our guests, and it's a question that we focus a lot on because sometimes we hear to people like yourself that you are in a successful uh, gamification evangelist. You're also teaching. You're also doing your PhD, and it sounds like you have it all figured out and that you don't commit mistakes. And that's something that we want to put a little bit of the of the of the highlight on. That we that there are things that don't always go the way that we expect. Even the, the, the biggest experts in the world get, have their downfalls. And I want to know of one of those times in which you were expecting to do something. You had this project, you had this idea, and it didn't go the way you expected. You had this first attempt in learning, or also known as fail, which you would call even your favorite fail because you learned a lot from it, or because you even turned it around in the end and were able to turn it into success. So can you can you give us that story, Adam? 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I told you before, I was uh, I worked as a teacher, a high school teacher. Uh, when I started to get interested in gamification, this was around um, 2010, around yeah, around 29, 2010 there. And uh, I was working with pupils with special needs. I worked with uh, pupils with uh, ADHD, autism, and they were. I had a quite, it was a group about 20, 15, 20 students, and they were all gamers, they were all into game, and the word of gamification had started to spread, I was reading about it, it was good for enhancing in motivation. So, and I, I got a background in uh, tabletop RPG design, and but I thought that I should make all the whole curriculum a game <laughs> and i started to to plan and made these character sheets and it was more or less dungeons and dragons but in a school environment and i i planned it rigorously and i i was i worked way too much with it and then i just presented I presented it for the students. They was like, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even interested. No, not even. Because I, 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 I made every, every assignment was filled with experience points. And they got checked the sheets. And they were, and I took too much game elements, too much game mechanics into it. And always made it like a storytelling game. And uh, a, a LARP, a LARP, so to speak. And they were like, no way. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is not working. Then I got back to the, to the blueprint, got back to, the, to my chamber, redesigned it and uh, started small and uh, got really good effects. And that's what I learned. You cannot do the whole shebang. You cannot do the whole thing in your head, in a, a sitting, planning gamification, in a chamber, uh, in your <laughs> ivory tower, so to speak, and then go out and just apply it. You have to know your users, you have to know what they want, what they, which behavior you want to drive, which behavior they, they feel that it's okay that you dry with gamification. So uh, I learned that you have to have, ex not experience, but you have to know your users. Yes. And uh, that's one of the most important lessons. I think it's absolutely you. central. It's not just about creating all these game mechanics, which sound like very much fun. And, and I, I don't know if you've heard of Monica Cornetti or Jonathan Peters, who talk yeah. about um, self-hugging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard it, yeah. <laughs> They, they, they talk about this whole thing of when we design a game or a gamification structure for us. And and that's the, the an easy mistake to, to commit. It's, it's easy for us to get confused and think that what is fun maybe for one of us is going to be fun for other people. And and I guess that the, the, the best antidote that we have to that is is going very deep into the user research as as Adam was very well pointing out. And I would I would say that would be the key learning from that lesson. Is that yeah. right, Adam? That, that's right. And uh, when I'm thinking about it, because I played, I, as I told you before, I, I designed a lot of tabletop art, RPGs here in Sweden. I, for, uh, I was working as a freelancer for the Free League Publishing. And, and I'm into tabletop RPG, but my, my students wasn't. They were into other games they have played some RPG, but it, it was digital RPG. They, they, they didn't know pen and paper RPG. So so I designed... <laughs> what does table. that even mean? Yeah, but, and I was like, I'm too old for this. <laughs> <laughs> so that was some two, two different worlds, two different generations collided. and uh, but, but I got out stronger. Oh, absolutely. You're, you're here today. And I'm sure that when you gamify your classes now... In these days, that you have taken up those those lessons and are, are you're committing at least new mistakes to, to get to learn from them as well and and to implement them in the future. Yeah, yeah. And actually, when I 
when I'm implementing my work, my gamifying my workshop or my my higher <clears throat> my higher education classes, I use real small game mechanics. Or, or actually, I use I stopped using just game mechanics, just talking about patterns, game patterns. It's like three or four mechanics that talking to each other and just apply one of those. So I have a, a, a game a game ecology in in the workshop so um, it's much easier to uh, to adjust and see real effect when you use game patterns so so adam you're, you're talking a bit about how you you come through with these workshops that you create that are gamified and i do have a very very interesting question for me and i'm sure that for many of the engagers and we always like to know a bit more about because you mentioned that you have the book in in swedish is that well first is that book in english as well no, sorry. <laughs> that that's going to come in the future, Adam. We're we're going to be asking you for for that English <laughs> version to get some of your knowledge as well. But in a in a nutshell, how would you describe that process for creating a gamified um, learning environment or a workshop? Do you follow some sort of a process? How how do you come about it? Yeah, uh, and I'm quite as a tabletop RPG designer. Uh, I'm all all about rules and um, transparent rule sets. Uh, have you played a pen and paper RPG? It's definitely on my list. I've, I've been getting it more. <laughs> no, no, seriously. It's, it's been getting more and more in, in my podcast. I, I, I mentioned before we started the podcast that I've moved to Spain a few years ago. And we're, we're establishing our social circle. That's something that I guess it never ends. Uh, but I think we're finally a, a bit better established in that, in that sense. And as soon as the the madness in which we're right now, and my my wife is doing her master's degree, I have my job, I have the podcast I'm teaching as well right now. Um, when the waters are a bit more calm, I will try to start exploring ways to to participate in pen and paper RPGs. Yeah, and you will. I hope that you will love it because I have my one of some of my best moments in life playing. I'm sure the, I will. Pen and paper, pen and paper RPG, but uh, pen and paper RPG difference difference a lot from digital games because digital games has hidden rule sets. Uh, when I play a first person shooter or when I play uh, even even when I play a digital RPG, there are hidden rule sets. I don't know why the world responds or corresponds to my action the way they do. But when I play um, uh, a tabletop or pen and paper RPG, it's all in the rules that I know that if I do this, X, Y, I will happen. And um, so when I plan a workshop, I'm very transparent with the rule set of the gamification design because in my book, I describe four important pillars that I use always in a gamification design that you have to have a clear goal, you have to have uh, rules to attain that goal, you have to have loads of positive and progressive feedback, but also you have to have a social connection to others or, or some connection to others or some connection to something that inspires or that you can identify with. And that is so important in tabletop RPGs and I apply this in all of my gamification designs. That makes a lot of sense so so you would basically sum it up in, in those four steps right um, yeah having a very clear goal, having the rules very clear giving the feedback and I'm I'm forgetting the fourth step the social connection with the others. social connection absolutely that makes a lot of sense it's something that we keep on hearing about how important it is for games to 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 push you into that social connection as well which gets people engaged uh, more often than not so i can i, I can completely agree with <laughs> with that pr proposal that you're putting on the table i think well, pun not intended, not for tabletop only. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's also uh, mirroring my career as a high school teacher. I was very interested in, in what's called uh, social culture, um, social culture teaching or transfer that we learn from each other. Uh, that's that's why I'm more into social gaming uh, and social gamification than 
there's a lot of talk that at least here in Sweden that gamification is all only about uh, operant conditioning and behaviorism but I'm getting it at from the other at the, at the, at the other end actually I'm talking about games as a social a social thing that we have been doing at least for five or six thousand years uh, and it's only the last 30 or 40 years we have been able to play single player. Uh, yeah. So I think that games has developed in these five or 6,000 years in connection with others and uh, that rules has been, it's, they, they have been transparent, they have, every, everyone knows the rules because you cannot play if you don't know the rules in in chess, for example. So I'm looking at ludologically or um, game study in that sense. That is a it's a, it's a very social thing. Yeah, and, and as you say, our our brains haven't evolved in the in the last thirty years. I mean, if they haven't evolved to to the fact that we now mostly live in in something that is not like the tribe we used to live in when when our brains developed. I wouldn't imagine our brains changing that much from the fact that games have been a social activity since almost since forever, as you as you mentioned. Yeah, and that's that's why I think storytelling is so important in gamification as well, because that humans, if you look into the cognitive sciences, and uh, there's a quite big group of uh, psychology researchers that's really emphasize that the human is a storytelling animal. It's one of the few storytelling animals, actually. And that we have for eons tell stories around campfires uh, with all these, how do you say, heralds or uh, rhapsodes or storytellers. We have been engaged with good stories and also been engaged with good games. Yes, and, and, and stories are only told, we can only hear a story from another person, so it's an essentially social activity, as you mentioned. Yes. Just a quick break before we continue. Are you enjoying this podcast? If you're listening through a podcasting app, please subscribe and rate us on the app. This will be of great help to reach more engagers so we can change the world together through gamification. So Adam, I want to now to move forward into sort of this second part of the interview where we go for re like specific recommendations, um, things like, for example, this first question, and it is about, and I, and I think I'm smelling where the answer might be coming towards, and it's if there's anything that you would say is sort of a best practice in gamification or, or something that if you are intending to use gamification, almost any project would, would certainly benefit from. Teaching learning and health is is two areas that are that have gained the most research uh, about uh, according to gamification so we can see that it really benefits there but i'm i really want to see, know more we we as researchers about gamification have some we have to rethink why we do gamification research because there's a lot of research out there that is so positive, positive to gamification. We have to be more critical. We have to look what are the backsides of gamification. I'm starting to see researchers now that are thinking about the ethical game design perspective. That what these are strong tools to to drive certain behaviors and who are we doing it for? Are we doing it for the users? Are we doing it for the the app developers? Or why why are why should we or why are we implementing gamification? And I think that the gamification designers out there have to ask them the self question: Are we doing it to empowering the users? Or are we doing it to make the users buy more things or use the apps? Or use the training apps even more. I had a I had a talk with a researcher in Norway a couple of days ago, and he said no app, no training app, no fitness app is going to tell you, oh, you have reached your goal, you have reached your your 
you decide, wait, uh, you should try another app. <laughs> because they want to uh, they want to keep you using the application. It's the same with dating apps. I mean, I heard stories about uh, I don't know what app uh, what dating app it was, but that their algorithm could actually made the perfect match. But if you if you got your perfect match, you would stop use the app. <laughs> so they were just making a 70% match. So you would keep using the application. So it would be good enough for you to keep on trying, but not so good that you would stop looking. Yeah. So and <laughs> the, the ethics are, are central. I don't know if you've heard also. I always mention the discussion because it was the first thing I encountered. And I, and I think he's, he's very good at, at the, his approach. Uh, the Gamification Ethics Code by Andrzej Marchewski. Yeah, yeah, I heard it. I heard about it. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a very good, at least as a framework, as a, as a way to think about it. The whole thing about the intent, because of course, I mean, there, there we can commit mistakes. That 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 happens. I mean, with great power comes great responsibility as well, and we have to try to do it a lot better. But we're still humans. We can still commit mistakes, and I do think that the intent. What are you looking for? What's What's this whole engagement capacity or, or power that you're using over your users? What's the intention and where are you leading them towards? And if if they want to be there, that then fine. If you're like sort of forcing their arm in a, in a psychological way, it's definitely not acceptable. And I completely agree. But Adam, I have another question as well. And I, and I think this is going to be a difficult one. What is your favorite game? Oh, um, I'm really into... Um, because I got um, I got two uh, uh, two small daughters now, so I really don't have so much time playing games. But me and my wife uh, play some tabletop RPG with some of my friends. But I'm really into board games at the moment, and at the moment, a, g- a great board game is Terraforming Mars. It's a really great board game. But if I'm going to take one of my favorite digital games, I would go for a quite new game, actually. It's called Star Star Traders Frontiers. And uh, you play a star trader going from different star system and uh, do trading. Uh, <laughs> and it sounds quite boring but it's 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 quite it makes me relax and i can play five or ten minutes on my iphone and then i just can put it down <laughs> i i buy some uh, some crystals on planet x and sells them and on planet y and buy some biomass and planet y and sells them on another planet so <laughs> so it's quite it's relaxing in some way <laughs> it's not like you're the hand solo of the game you're actually oh, doing no. the, oh, no, the, no, the no. legal ones no, i've done some smuggling <laughs> 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 but um but there there are always classics i i'm not a civ fan i played a lot of civilization games i i'm a history teacher i should say <laughs> <laughs> So Adam, after listening to all these questions that we've been making, after listening, you told me as well that you listened to a few of the episodes as well. Is there somebody that comes to your mind that you would like to listen to his his or her answers in an episode of Professor Game? I would love to hear uh, uh, Sebastian Deterding if you haven't had have him had him. Yes, I, I would like to have him. He hasn't been on the show. We we were kind of in contact, but I think. Something happened with my emails. They're, they're probably not reaching him, but I, I will. I will insist on that contact. If you have any any way to reach him as well, that would be fantastic. We can talk at the end of the yeah. interview. He is a fantastic. He was my first, literally the first reference to gamification. That definition that he he uses was my first reference in gamification. Completely am- admire his work. Yeah, and he's uh, he's quite how do you say. Um... Uh, he has a critical view on it that I really admire and uh, he was one of my first gates into gamification as well and I'm really glad it was him and not someone else because there's a lot of good gamification designers there but they I think Sebastian Deterding puts efforts into thinking about why are we doing this and why are we doing that Yes, yes. Asking the why is always super, super important. 
in that same sense of recommendations, is there is if you had to recommend one book to an audience like this one who's interested in gamification, maybe especially in teaching and learning, is there any book that you would recommend? Of course, aside from your book, when you have it in English, which book would that be and why? Uh, I'm going to go beyond gamification and talk about ludology, and I will recommend Homo Ludus, Homo Ludens about from the i think he is we singer or something like yeah, that right singer yeah the it's dutch uh so uh, it's it's a great book uh when discussing gamification especially his the chapter about the mer- magic circle i think it's it's great and it's it's very important to have that in uh, in all the design thinking about the, uh, the magic circle. But if you're into behavior economics and behavior design and uh, psychology, I will recommend Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. It's it's a bit of a brick, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a good it's a it's a it's a very good and uh, well written piece. Definitely. And Adam, now we're talking about these things and about the great work that other people have done. I would like to know what would you consider is your your superpower or your sweet spot when doing gamification? Because I've been doing a lot of workshops with different clients, I'm starting to get really good at understanding what the client wants and what is their need for gamification. I met I meet a lot of clients that say that we want to drive this behavior, but when we start talking, they are, and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to convince them, but when we start talking, they realize that, oh no, we don't want to drive these behaviors. We want to drive those behaviors. So we actually, we want to make the software product more in this way, not in that way. Uh, and that is my gamification superpower to see what the client, what which kind and which type of gamification the client wants. If it's going to be a collaborative, uh, if it's going to be competitive, if the, it's just achievement-driven gamification, is it is this, is it um, how do you say exploring gamification? That makes a lot of sense, and I'm sure it's very very useful both for your for your company work and as well as understanding what finding out what it is what you want when you're going for your classes as well that's a superpower when you're creating all of these learning experiences yeah and i think also that um, when you work so close with the end user as a teacher you see uh, we talked about feedback before doing webinars when you work with in a classroom or in a higher education context, then that you can see the you get the feedback from the gamification design directly. You have you have opportunity, you have chance to alter something that is going to uh, happen next next course or next uh, lesson or next whatever. And that's super powerful. When you work as a gamification designer and you're going to apply gamification in a software project that is going to have an impact on tens or even hundreds of thousands of users, but you never even meet one of those users, then it's it's more tricky. And then you have to, then you have to, the design has to be good from the start, I think. Yes, yes. And and as well, I don't recommend, I definitely don't recommend never meeting any of the final users. No. But if it's a condition um, and you have to face that, it certainly is a larger challenge by a large difference. So, Adam, uh, we are getting to the end of the interview, but I don't want to let you go without you let, letting us know where we can find more about you. I mean, the whole plug zone in general. If you have any final piece of advice for, for the engagers before we, we before we finish this interview, and then, of course, we'll say that it's game over. Yeah, uh, you can find me at, uh, I get a web page. It's adampanquist.com, I think. And I also get a LinkedIn, and it's Adam Panquist there as well. These, these will be in the show notes for sure. So if you go to yeah. professorgame.com, <laughs> search for Adam, you will find the show notes for this episode. And you can also uh, visit my publisher at 
it's student literature <laughs> and the book is called The Spillifierade Klassrummet. If you're into uh, learning Swedish or if you if you only uh, already know Swedish and you want to get into how you can use gamification in a Swedish context. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. In fact, I have a colleague who married a, a Swedish guy. They have a, they have a daughter together and she knows Swedish. So maybe she can help me a little bit to understand your book. I'm not sure if she'll be into gamification as much as I am, but <laughs> I might tr- give it a try. Yeah, and I can give you the web page. Uh, as well of course fantastic though those will be all in the show notes thank you very much adam because as we were mentioning from the start the, uh, you have all these roles going on all these things going on at the same time and that makes it for a very very busy schedule so we really appreciate the time that you spend with us today it's been a pleasure to have all of your recommendations all of your experience here in professor game but now it's time to say that it's game over okay game over Engagers, it's fantastic to have you around. And this podcast only makes sense with you. So let's connect on Twitter. That way you can let me know who would you like to have as a guest, if you have any questions, what we can help you with. You can find my Twitter account in professorgame.com slash Twitter. I'm always sharing content on gamification, especially around topics like education and learning. So before you click continue, Would you like to know about a certain master's in gamification that is in an online format? You probably want to listen to Oscar Garcia and he's next week's episode. So if you want to listen to this, subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to the next episode of Professor Game. See you there.